Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here with you today. My name is Lauren Barreto, and I'm head of partnerships at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. It's my great honor and pleasure on behalf of the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and UNESCO to welcome everyone to the celebration of the inaugural International Day of Conscience. The Kingdom of Bahrain had originally planned to convene us in person at UN headquarters, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 situation has changed this plan and plunged the world into its deepest crisis since World War II. Uh, that aside, we're very grateful for the opportunity to come together virtually with you and to share in this goodwill and message of this day. We hope everyone tuning in online is staying safe, and we're glad that you could join us. What more important time could there be for a message of peace? I also want to thank all of our wonderful participants joining online and our incredible speakers. We have a great lineup today. I'd like to briefly remind everyone of some logistics. Please keep yourselves muted when not speaking, and we're using the chat feature if you have any questions for our speakers. So feel free to chat them over. We'll have some time for that at the end of the broadcast. We've also got several resources uploaded as handouts. So the agenda is there, as well as some instructions on how to use the GoToMeeting software and a PDF to troubleshoot any audio issues, particularly if anyone finds that they're not getting sound and they can't hear anything. Um, you can also use the chat if you have any issues with that. And so now that we've gone over our logistics, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the microphone and the floor over to SDSN Director, and United Nations SDG advocate, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining this virtual celebration of the first International Day of Conscience. Obviously, we are gathering together virtually today at, a, at an unprecedented moment. Uh, certainly one of the most dire crises of modern history. Uh, all of humanity is in peril. Uh, the COVID-19 virus has already claimed more than 70,000 lives and has infected well over 1.3 million people around the world. Every country is affected. More than half of the planet is now on a a lockdown or a shutdown uh, economically to try to stop the spread of the infection. People everywhere are at risk, everywhere. But we must remember today the special vulnerability of the poor. They lack income. They are losing jobs by the tens of millions. They are unable, unlike others, to stay fully sheltered. Uh, they are therefore highly vulnerable to uh, the contagion. And they lack, by definition of uh, poverty, assurance uh, to health care, adequate food, safe water, and other basic needs. Rich countries are voting trillions and trillions of dollars of uh, emergency response, as they should. But what can the poorest countries do? We urgently need global solidarity to ensure that the poor, as well as the rich, can battle and surmount this scourge. We will need emergency international funding, emergency supplies, and very deep debt relief for indebted developing countries in need. For all of this, we are grateful to have an International Day of Conscience to support the best in the human spirit, to build a culture of peace, and to honor the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the UN system in its 75th year this year. The International Day of Conscience was adopted by the UN General Assembly on the 25th of July, 2019, in the 73rd session of the UN General Assembly. According to the resolution that created the International Day of Conscience, and I quote, the International Day of Conscience constitutes a means of regularly mobilizing the efforts of the international community to promote peace, tolerance, inclusion, understanding and solidarity in order to build a sustainable world of peace, solidarity, and harmony. The resolution explicitly recognizes two great institutions, the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, which gave rise to the concept of the culture of peace more than 30 years ago, and the UN Alliance of Civilizations, which promotes intercultural dialogue. 
we are very lucky to have outstanding leaders of these two world leading organizations with us today. Let me thank the Kingdom of Bahrain for its championing of peace and understanding and for being such a vital custodian of this important day. The Kingdom of Bahrain has brought us together virtually. Uh, they were going to bring us together at UN headquarters. We are most grateful to the Kingdom. Let me also thank UNESCO and the Alliance of Civilizations and great humanitarian leadership organizations, uh, including the One Campaign. Now it is my very deep honor to welcome our uh, first uh, guest, the Honorable Maria Fernanda Espinoza, a world-leading diplomat, environmentalist, and humanitarian who was president of the UN General Assembly in the 73rd session from September 2018 to September 2019, and who led the way to the UN General Assembly's adoption of the International Day of Conscience. Maria Fernanda Espinosa has brilliantly served her country, Ecuador, as foreign minister and defense minister. And it is a great honor and pleasure to introduce a friend and someone that I admire so much. Uh, I turn the microphone over to you now. Oh, oh great, great. I'm sorry, Maria. Glad to see you. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me properly. We hear you well. Okay, yeah. well, very, well. good morning everybody and thank you the organizers for bringing us together to commemorate the first ever International Day of Conscious. And I think this is very, very timely. I, I would like to also acknowledge the leadership of, of Bareng, Prime Minister, uh, the United Nations, uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and its director, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, to convey uh, my gratitude to all the panelists today. I think uh, this commemoration, as Jeff uh, very well uh, put it, is very timely. I think that we need precisely now to foster a greater understanding, greater solidarity, greater mindfulness. Now it is the time to, to truly build a culture of peace uh, to face this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which uh, has put under stress and fear the entire humanity. Uh, I believe that uh, today, today uh, more than ever, we are uh, aware of our sense of belonging to the human family and that we have realized how vulnerable and frail we all are. And uh, this crisis is about uh, understanding that our lives depend uh, on um, the conscious of oneself and of others, and uh, that we should uh, acknowledge that we are radically interdependent. I think that, as we all know, uh, COVID-19 is having unprecedented impact in the way we live, the way we communicate, the way we interact, and also in the way we produce and consume. So, but perhaps more importantly, in the way we uh, all look at the future. I think that uh, we have to use these catastrophic scenarios as a wake-up call uh, to our country. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity to build a new common sense. Uh, we cannot do the same. We cannot act the same. We cannot pretend that everything is going to be okay. We need to craft collectively radical change. And, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, I would like to... Uh, to contribute to this conversation, to talk about very briefly what have been the lessons learned in this, in this past weeks and months, um, and, and to see, to grow from that, to think about our collective future. First of all, the, the, the very uh, fact that inequality and poverty are determining factors for vulnerability and access to healthcare and public services in general. The second, Lessons learned, is, lesson learned is that we do need strong health systems, that universal health coverage has to be considered a common, a common public good, a human right, and that um, this, uh, this pandemia, pandemic has showed that um, the impact is stronger in vulnerable communities such as refugees, persons with disabilities, and women, and perhaps 
just a note on, on women because they are and have been at the forefront of this crisis as, as caretakers, as health workers. And uh, women represent 70% of the global healthcare workers, and they are, of course, key uh, to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, women, women and girls are experiencing higher level of domestic violence in the wake of the pandemic. So this is, uh, of course, uh, requires um, a global response. Um, several alternatives are on the table. Um, hundreds of analyses, uh, ideas have emerged in different areas. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for an immediate global ceasefire uh, to help people in zones of war to receive uh, life-saving aid to fight the pandemic. High Commission on Human Rights has urged governments to release a person detained without sufficient legal basis, including political prisoners, to prevent catastrophic rates of infection. General Assembly has just passed a resolution last week on the economic front. Uh, we have, the, uh, we have uh, uh, heard several calls to rethink our economy, uh, our financial architectures. There are countless analysis and options uh, from debt relief to a new Bretton Woods. UNCTAD uh, has called for a 2.5 trillion coronavirus crisis package for developing countries uh, to turn solidarity into meaningful global action. And uh, very importantly, South Center has called for a waiver on intellectual property rights on equipment, treatment, and prevention of COVID-19. So we have had a plethora of well-intentioned, well-articulated analysis and proposal. And I believe that we need uh, a, an exercise of this signifying, of, of rewriting the narrative. We need to redefine key concepts such as wealth, for example. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, the owner of a huge bank in Spain uh, died because he couldn't uh, reach the hospital uh, sooner. And uh, I think that the new currency has to be measured by the number of masks and ventilators that a country is able to produce or buy. Uh, well-being should be defined by our, by our very ability to breathe. And affection, perhaps, has to be defined by the number of smiles, of emojis or phone calls that we can make. And of course, uh, the very concept of sustainability has to be uh, more than ever grounded on preparedness and resilience. Uh, so what it is clear is that we need a new social contract based on solidarity, on generosity, and uh, for these proposals to translate into action, we need the obvious, and the obvious is a strong multilateral response. Global leadership, shared responsibilities, collective action. Uh, in this first commemoration of the International Day of Conscience, uh, this uh, should remind us uh, that each one of us uh, has a role to play, that we all matter, and that this crisis is an opportunity to fight indifference, selfishness, and greed. It is a golden opportunity to build a new common sense, a new social contract that will work for all, leaving no one behind. So I thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Ambassador Espinosa. Um, I really liked your point, calling for a greater mindfulness in these challenging times and also to create radical change, um, particularly to address COVID 19, but also for our many uh, challenges. Next, we have the great honor to turn to the President of the Prime Minister's Court of Bahrain, Sheikh Hussam bin Essa Al Khalifa. So I'll ask those who are speaking to be the camera and for the um, the President of the Prime Minister's Court to connect. Professor Jeffrey, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, evening. My thanks and appreciation to Professor Jeffrey for the nice such for such a distinguished guest. I pray to Allah for you all stay and healthy prosperity. Before I start, His Royal Highness asked me first to convey personally is a special thanks and gratitude to many people who have helped turn this idea into reality. I'm honored to read this word and message. On this 
international prayer councils, we should inspire to recognize the importance of value of world conscious, to combat the threats to the world, future, and the achievement of our joint objective for a world of peace and harmony. The value that I lay to the world to the necessity of shouldering our collective responsibility while recognizing that of our collaborative effort are to be of value, they must reinforce the global unity and fulfill the inspiration of all people. Peace, growth, and stability are achievable goals, but only with a clear concept of many threats humanity faces and in the determination of unified global response. It's our sincere belief that the initiative in calling for the observance of International Day of Conscience reflect upon God behest to the humanity as is told through the world words of his prophet Muhammad peace upon him. Conscious is the ray of light and hope that, that direct us in everything that reinforces the value of love and peace, cooperation, understanding, the provider of the people. There is no escaping the fact that the world is facing a global challenge. The pandemic brought about by the prepared spread of the coronavirus and the pain of the heavily loses it has and will turn back up humanity beyond belief. belief. Like if a proof is needed that humanity is up is a dark one, we look no farther than the manner of spread of this virus, it's a threat global, making no distinguish as to race, color, or creed. It is one of the certainly does not recognize national, nationality, classes, or social standing. The consequences are tragic. It is a situation where none of us can claim a clear conscience. Globalization to develop through control and submissive, a strategy has no place in today's world. We need to encourage a shift toward a policy of humanitarian globalization and use this day of conscience as the starting point in defining world conscious that has universal humanitarian value. One, that stand for and adequate peace and compassion while representing everything that promotes justice in and equality. Only an assertive and truthful conscience can inspire humanity in dealing with the pandemic or for that matter other crises such as those brought about by property. If we are to lead, pioneer and contribute with purpose to the fulfillment of a human aspiration, we must do so under the umbrella of the United Nations. On this day of conscience, we have an opportunity to maximize our contribution to the potential for change and the incentive that the drive development. It is an occasion to listen to our conscience, the strong and loudest inner voice of love and peace, that guide us toward taking a pioneering role in promoting policy that harness the philosophy of world conscious to serve humanitarian objectives. To see a future in which achievement of civilization are available for a future generation, then it is for us all to endure world conscious with its 
natural vitality. To enable to interact generically with all efforts that seek a sustainable future that covers unity and harmony for the sake of a global cooperation, justice, equality, and respect for human dignity. In conclusion, we would like once again to thank the United Nations for its pioneer role in advancing understanding and the culture of peace. By hosting this webinar in the most difficult circumstances. Finally, we call upon the international community to devise a strategy to enhance the concept of global health security. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Excellency. And I couldn't agree more that today is just the starting point, and we look forward to celebrating many observations of the International Day of Conscience in the years to come. Next, we have a message from the UN Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. Unfortunately, she could not be with us today. Uh, she sent us regrets, but Professor Sachs is going to uh, read the message. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Nobody is working harder than uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and uh, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed uh, to try uh, as urgently as possible to bring this uh, horrific epidemic under control. They put the UN institutions at the very center of the battle against uh, COVID-19 and they're leading global efforts uh, to uh, bring all of our multilateral institutions to bear in this crisis and also to keep us on track uh, in this moment at our fundamental objectives of uh, human rights and sustainable development. I'm pleased to be able to read a statement by uh, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. She says, we commemorate the International Day of Conscience in a moment when the world faces a human crisis unlike any we have seen in the 75-year history of the United Nations. The UN General Assembly declared on the 5th of April uh, the International Day of Conscience as a means of regularly mobilizing the efforts of the international community to, mo to promote peace, tolerance, inclusion, understanding, and solidarity in order to build a sustainable world of peace, solidarity, and harmony. Today, we have an opportunity to come together to respond to the multiple dimensions and the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic reinforces how interconnected the world is, reminding us that we are all one human family. Its magnitude demonstrates that only through a collective effort will we overcome. Governments, businesses, academia, civil society, and individuals need to come together in mounting the most robust and cooperative response the world has ever seen. As the United Nations Secretary General has said, and I quote, this human crisis demands coordinated, decisive, inclusive, and innovative policy action from the world's leading economies and maximum financial and technical support for the poorest and most vulnerable people and countries, unquote. These are extraordinary times that require extraordinary measures. We cannot lose our shared conscience. We cannot forget that we are part of a human family connected and bound by something far more powerful and significant than what divides us. More than ever, we understand the importance of the implementation of the sustainable development goals. We have the opportunity to learn and to build back better. In the face of this crisis, we can strengthen the world's resilience. That is the main purpose of the International Day of Conscience, to build a culture of peace with love and conscience based on cooperation, solidarity, and respect to human rights. Our attitudes and behaviors during this time will reflect the path we want to pursue in the construction of a sustainable world of justice, inclusion, and compassion. End of statement. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was great. Um, 
So also uh, keeping with the theme of the COVID-19 at this dire moment in the global pandemic, we're also fortunate to be able to share some video remarks from World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Your Excellency, your Excellency, Sheikh Hassan, Hassan excellencies, excellencies, distinguished guests, distinguished guests colleagues and friends. Colleagues and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to thank His Highness Prince Khalifa, the Prime Minister of Bahrain, for his vision and leadership in initiating this day. The COVID-19 pandemic is reminding us that although we have different languages, traditions, and beliefs, Hello. we're one human race. We share the same DNA, but we also share the same hope for a life of peace, harmony, and health. The International Don't Day is anything. a powerful reminder that we're united Hello. in our struggle against a common threat. The only way to defeat the pandemic and save lives is by working together as one in a spirit Hello. of solidarity. A new coronavirus is taking so much from us, but it's also giving us something special, Hello. the opportunity to work together as one. COVID-19 will leave a deep scar for many individuals, families, communities, and nations. <sighs> But my hope is that its legacy will Hello? also be a world that's more connected, more united, and more harmonious. Shukran Jazilan, Your Highness, for this incredible Hello? Uh, achievement. And Shukran Jazilan, Bahrain. I thank you. Hello? Hello? I don't hear anything. Hmm? I'm sorry. I think you were missing the uh, the video otter, uh, audio. Apologies, Mr. Moratinos. So we're going to um, continue with the agenda. Okay. I, I'm, I'm still here, but uh, now I don't hear anything. I mean, you, yes, I, mean, I hear you. Hmm? Apologies for that. Um, so again, we're very grateful to have such an important message from Dr. Tedros, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to introduce our next speaker. Okay. Yes, please, please uh, for all speakers, uh, please be on mute uh, when you're not speaking, uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, 800 people uh, right now uh, in the chat room, so everybody has to be uh, uh, silent uh, while others are speaking. Uh, and uh, we are indeed uh, lucky to have, uh, I mean, very fortunate to have the people who are uh, leading uh, this struggle uh, together uh, sharing this International Day of Conscience uh, from WHO, uh, from uh, the leadership of the UN uh, itself. Uh, and now uh, I'm absolutely uh, delighted to, to introduce our very distinguished next speaker. The Day of Conscience is about peace, solidarity, and respect for cultural diversity, the very mission of UNESCO. Uh, the wonderful organization committed to a shared world of science, education, and culture. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have with us uh, the Assistant Director General for Education, uh, who leads the world's efforts uh, for education for all, for SDG 4, uh, and especially for SDG 4.7 which calls for an education for sustainable development, for global citizenship, for tolerance, and for peace. Uh, Dr. Stefania Giannini is a very a great leader of global education. She was Minister of Education of Italy before taking on uh, the huge global responsibilities for UNESCO. She is a distinguished academic uh, and uh, a, a wonderful linguist uh, who uh, uh, inspires us and leads us. So, Stefania, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for UNESCO's uh, leadership. This is a day also to celebrate UNESCO's role in the world. Thank you very much. 
thank you very much. Uh, hope you can hear me uh, well. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Professor Sachs, dear Jeff, uh, uh, let me start uh, thanking very much for this initiative and the honor of, uh, uh, of this invitation. And let me also start with a personal note. Uh, I feel that uh, we mark really this first international day of uh, uh, conscience uh, quite timely, uh, as uh, in this uh, in this global crisis, which is affecting all of humanity and hitting very much hard uh, some countries uh, more. Uh, thinking of, of my country, Italy, as you said. Uh, which is one of the very first in Europe, but now we can say it's really a global, global, uh, you know, new tragedy we have facing. We see our extreme vulnerability and the role of conscience. Conscience, as a word, uh, comes from from uh, uh, all Latin and means uh, knowing uh, uh, within oneself, knowing uh, um, and being aware of what is wrong and what is right. And I really commend the Kingdom of Bahrain uh, for the initiatives of this resolution, uh, which is quite close to the heart of uh, UNESCO mandate, building peace uh, in minds of uh, women and men through education, culture, and science, and strengthen uh, in, more than ever today uh, intellectual and moral solidarity. So. Today, we can say that uh, uh, since 75 years uh, from the establishment of the UN system, uh, the same sentiment uh, uh, of global solidarity is the only cure we have uh, to this unprecedented situation we are facing. And uh, solidarity is rooted uh, um, in this uh, consciousness, awareness of a common, common humanity and the shared planet, uh, and, uh, and with also that uh, of uh, a sense of universal responsibility towards both. And uh, this awareness uh, starts with education. So let me, let me assume first this angle and moving on to the, the issue of cultural diversity, which is the other pillar together with science of our mandate at UNESCO and uh, how we can uh, try to contribute to this uh, global uh, crisis uh, today. So education, we can say, I, I'm sure uh, everybody around this table today uh, agree with me that uh, uh, has been one of the most revolutionary uh, human rights advances of the past uh, 70 uh, years uh, and also still powerful tool to address inequalities. But today, today we, we face a nearly uh, unprecedented situation unexpected situation. Close to 90% of the world's uh, students, uh, that means 1.5 billion uh, children and youth uh, in um, 188 countries, are affected by school um, and university closures. So almost overnight uh, from this uh, observatory of UNESCO, a global observatory, as you know, we have seen the world's most advanced countries, and now, more recently now, some of the poorest, uh, running to put their contents online and uh, uh, to move from the traditional classroom to a new learning platform. And uh, we can define this as it's, it's one of the, the, the most uh, uh, global, uh, rapid social experiment within education and outside the system and the speed at which governments have reacted to ensure that learning doesn't stop learning must continue is really impressive but we know we know and we not don't forget within this the, the sdg4 uh, uh, big family I should say like this that for millions of disadvantaged and most valuable learners distance learning opportunities are not, uh, are, are not uh, they are disposed immediately. So countering this was the first uh, uh, impetus for UNESCO to launch the COVID-19 Global Coalition uh, on, to, to address uh, education uh, response uh, on March uh, uh, 25th. 
and uh, more than uh, 80 now, public uh, and uh, from the private sector and uh, civil society partners joined the coalition. The coalition aims uh, to unlock distance learning solutions that are free, universal and accessible and to defend the right of the people in all circumstances. I think that uh, the challenge now, let me say, uh, goes beyond technology and connectivity. And uh, it's really very much about uh, the resilience of the human fabric, if I say like this, uh, emotional well-being and care for the most vulnerable and fragile. And this is something that brings me to the new roadmap we'll have after the crisis within the SDG4. I, I understand this crisis, this, this pandemic, as a wake-up call for education system to prepare learners for a world of complexity, precarity and uncertainty, but it's also a call for developing a sense of caring, taking care for self, taking care for others and the planet, and uh, everything in a spirit of uh, respect and solidarity. So in other words, this is very much uh, what, uh, uh, what we know is the ambition of uh, uh, target 4.7 within the, 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 the roadmap of uh, education, quality education for all SDG 4, and uh, must remain, this 4.7, I should say, must remain uh, uh, our roadmap for shifting paradigms and leaving no one behind after the crisis. Our programs on uh, education for sustainable development and global citizenship are very much at the core of the renewed global conscious conscience that we need and we need more and more within the crisis and beyond the crisis. And that's what we are doing at UNESCO. Uh, I mentioned the Global Coalition, I can mention uh, this uh, important, impressive uh, call for action to the scientist community uh, with the ministerial conference Michael League has organized last week, what we are doing about valorizing the importance of culture today. Sharing culture is one of the main messages that UNESCO is, is uh, disseminating and, and uh, reaching uh, every single person uh, at home. No? We say stay at home, sharing knowledge, culture and science. So, uh, I think the resolution of, for this uh, International Day, uh, it's a very power mes powerful message, uh, it's our own message, and uh, this is how we are appealing to everyone's conscience to protect education now, through and beyond the crisis, to protect the role of science. Uh, politicians must listen to science more and more, definitely we understood, and, uh, and uh, to build uh, a new, maybe, better world uh, within this crisis and after. So thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, all of you, and looking forward to what you get about that. Thank you so much, Ms. Giannini. Your points about ensuring access to distance learning for the world's most poor and vulnerable, or you know, finding alternative solutions to them in this critical time is a, is a vital point to make today. I'd like to remind people that we will have some Q&A at the end of the broadcast. And so we've been getting a few questions via the chat, but if anybody else has questions they want to put to our panelists, just a reminder to keep sending those in. We're keeping track of them. Um, so we're moving on to some more wonderful speakers and special guests. It's my great honor and pleasure to now introduce two-time Academy Award winning actor and producer, Mr. Michael Douglas, who also is a great humanitarian and serves as a UN messenger of peace. Um, Mr. Douglas, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. I think we might need to connect your audio. There's an icon that um, might be orange and should be green just above the video one. I might also be able... Great, thank you so much. All right. Uh, good morning again, Professor Sachs and my fellow partners. Um, as a United Nations messenger of peace, I often reflect on how the UN is a unique home address for the entire human family, a place where we means everyone. As the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, without distinction of any kind. 
is a place founded on a moral vision of a world of equality, free from fear, want, and war. And I remind us that we share this home all together. This year, through the collective wisdom of the world, the world's nations, the UN General Assembly, guided by the leadership of Bahrain, thank you, adopted Resolution 73-329, promoting the culture of peace with love and conscience, which establishes the International Day of Conscience. Now, it is surprising in a time of so much cynicism, dysfunctional adversity, and discord for a political instrument to so strongly articulate our highest values, peace, love, and conscience. And these precious human capacities are so needed to address so many threats to our family's well-being, such as climate change, environmental degradation, gross poverty, and nuclear weapons. The UN Charter calls us to, quote, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And today, humanity is engaged in a war, but it's a real, it is not between any nations or peoples. It is a war against all nations and all peoples. And it's a war which cannot be won by all the world's armies, despite the nearly $2 trillion spent on their weapons last year, nor by the over 14,000 nuclear bombs through which nine states pursue security daily and a persistent, irrational, hazardous threat of use. It's a war waged by COVID-19, a microscopic virus too small for the eye to see, but powerful enough to compel us to think about and knew about ourselves. And we may be socially distant, but we're all feeling a common sense of vulnerability. Anyone tuned to the voice of conscience can recognize that what binds us together far exceeds any issues that should lead us to violence. Conscience reminds us that no woman, nor man, nor nation is an island. We must now call upon government leaders to bring global conscience into action to address the present threat to human security. The world's most powerful nations must put aside their differences and convene and utilize the power of the UN Security Council to bring reality to the recent General Assembly resolution calling for, quote, intensified international cooperation to contain, mitigate, and defeat the COVID-19 disease. The resolution creating the special day makes specific reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article one states, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and they are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. The resolution calls us to go beyond the spirit of brotherhood into the active expression of love. The declaration calls us to advance it through teaching and education. And I suggest supporting the civil society initiative being championed by the Global Security Institute to obtain a general assembly resolution encouraging every ministry of education to ensure to the best of their ability that every secondary school child be given either physically or electronically a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and when possible, classroom enforcement of its contents. I also wish to bring a specific matter of conscience before us. On October 18th, 2018, the UN Humanitarian Rights Commission affirmed that the threat of use of nuclear weapons is incompatible with respect for the right to life and may amount to a crime against humanity, end of quote. And further, that states must also pursue in good faith negotiations in order to achieve that aim of nuclear disarmament under strict and effective international controls. Taking away the adversity inherent in the human rights violating threat of nuclear annihilation, educating the next generation of the importance of the rights and dignity of every precious life would be a step to advancing a culture of peace, 
and an expression of love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Douglas, for your wise and incredibly moving words, as well as your leadership on the issue of peace. Um, we have a slight schedule change because one of our speakers has a difficult time strength we're trying to accommodate. So we're actually going to jump to SDG advocate, high level commissioner on health employment and economic growth and medical doctor, Dr. Ala Murabit. This is the exact combination of expertise we need so much in our world today. And so we are delighted to hear from you today. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I think it's incredible to be um, having this conversation, particularly in this moment. Um, I know everyone here is not immune to the reality of, of what's happening. And, um, you know, I think it's so important for us to be bringing a few things to light. And, and that's, we're all kind of urgently talking about what's happening in the now, um, which is important. We need to be addressing um, the current crisis. We need to be creating opportunities and solutions for people. Um, but, but I do think that, if anything, the International Day of Conscience can remind us that it's so incredibly important to be asking how is this going to impact us in the future? And what needs to change to make this system more accessible and more tangible and more supportive for all people? not only you know a, a select few um i know many of us have been watching the news uh, probably more than we should um for the past few weeks and and i think something that has has really stuck in my mind is we're looking at these conversations around essential workers uh and and we're looking around this idea of you know these are the people that have to be at work for everything from doctors and nurses on the front lines and hospitals to grocery store workers to you know um, mail delivery to to teachers who are who are still trying to do the best that they can from their homes but these are the people that we are saying are absolutely essential and the vast majority of those occupations are completely underestimated and and under resourced in our communities um, as a doctor and as a, as a high level commissioner on health and economic growth, I'm gonna specifically focus on health for a second. You know, when we when we talk about the importance of responding in a crisis, I, I think what we've seen, you know, around the world has been that this virus does not discriminate as most don't. Um, and yet, yet the, the percentage of um, African-Americans, for example, in the United States, or of the more marginalized and the more disenfranchised that are passing away around the world is significant. It's something that we actually need to register. And so it becomes a question, the virus clearly isn't what's discriminating, but the underlying foundation for those communities has always been imbalanced. It's always, there has always been a lack of resources in healthcare. There's always been undermined infrastructure. And that actually ends up becoming incredibly important when you have a pandemic like this. So we have to begin to ask ourselves, how do our current economic priorities align to our values and morals? Because if we're still at the point where we are saying, you know what, we are um, countries that are for dignity, we are people that believe in in human rights and in peace building and in respect and in, you know, if, if we're saying we fundamentally believe in that, then we have to actually show that based on where we prioritize our resources. And the fact that, you know, many politicians for the past few weeks have been saying this is a war um, and yet healthcare is not resourced like wars are at all. Um, you know, we have we have nurses around the world who who are going into work. If that, um, if they're if they're able to going into work wearing garbage bags, and so I think we really need to it really bring to light like, such an important conversation, which is if we say that we are about fundamental human rights, and 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 if we are today talking about really, you know, bringing to light the difficult conversations that we need to be having, what does our current healthcare system and and what does our current economic model say? about the value of human life. Thank you so much, Dr. Murabit. We appreciate you taking the time today, and I especially enjoyed your focus on inequality and the need to build more just and equal societies as we try to address this current challenge. No, thank um, you so much for having me. It was wonderful to be here, and I apologize that I um, had that 10 o'clock hard stop. Not a problem, happy to work around your schedule. Uh, Jeff, would you like to jump in again to introduce our next speaker, please? I would indeed. Uh, thank you, Allah, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Michael Douglas, uh, for 
your leadership and your very, very powerful words really resonated. Your idea of uh, putting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into the hands of every high school student in the world uh, uh, is something uh, we'll really act on. Uh, it's such an important basic idea that um, needs to be done so that new uh, generation of uh, young uh, leaders understands uh, well uh, and has the tools well to uh, keep the world uh, at peace. Uh, one of the institutions that is recognized as a, a fundamental uh, leader in the culture of peace is the uh, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. Uh, and it's uh, my great uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, the leader, the high representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, Miguel Angel Moratinos, who is a great friend, a great champion uh, of sustainable development, uh, who is one of the world's uh, most experienced and savvy diplomats who knows the world. He uh, was Spain's foreign minister for six years. He's been engaged in solving tough problems uh, in all parts of the world. He's a great friend of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, Miguel, it's a, thank you so much for being with us uh, and uh, thank you for the leadership of the Alliance for Civilizations. It's a, uh, we're, we're all very excited to hear your thoughts. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I don't know if you hear me. I know that you don't see me. That is the technological uh, challenge still. In, in we hear some, you. Uh, Okay, thank you. So let's start by, of course, uh, by greeting all of you uh, here in Europe and different parts of the world and to commemorate this uh, International Day of Conscience. I think uh, you refer to that, uh, Jeffrey, the EU General Assembly Resolution A-73 was uh, the one who promotes culture of peace with love and conscience. And everybody will have a refer to that. And of course, we have to command the leadership of the King of uh, Bahrain, King Hamad, and of course, uh, also, you know, the, His Highness uh, Prince Khalifa bin Salman and uh, the government of Bahrain for this, uh, this resolution. The UN OSC, United Nations Allowed Centralization, was the among the first to support the resolution. We also received last year uh, a delegation of the Parliament of Bahrain in order to see how we could implement this resolution. Because it's not enough just to make a call to decide to have a UN International Day, and how this principle of conscience, how we are going to implement on the ground. And of course, I have to commend my dear friend, the president of the 73th session of the UN General Assembly, my dear friend, Maria Fernanda, Thank you, Maria Fernanda, for your leadership and your continued engagement in this issue. Uh, uh, well, Jeffrey, I think uh, you as a Sustainable Development Solution Network and your initiative of uh, uh, Ethic for Action, you were always very much close to how to get together the ESDG with also, you know, this uh, principle of solidarity, fraternity, and of course, of conscience. So um, today, when we are uh, commemorating this uh, important day, I think the, for the first time after the World War II, that the entire humanity is facing the same threat at the same time. It's also the first time that everybody recognizes how interconnected our faith are despite the closed border and travel restriction. This is a kind of paradox. We close border, but we are more integrated than ever. So really, that is something like us to think about. So this sense of unity, solidarity, compassion, and international cooperation are of absolute essential to address the pandemic. I think we have to really defeat it through this uh, kind of uh, common cooperation and common responsibility in order to succeed. That's one of the reasons that uh, we, with my dear colleague Adam Ayan, we, we really sense, we call for a joint appeal in order to really uh, create uh, this sense of uh, humanity, solidarity, and compassion. So that is the way that the Secretary General also 
mandate us at Mayan and myself to produce and to continue to develop this uh, call. But before to leave uh, this uh, important gathering of today, I was thinking last night how we can really understand what the word conscience means. And I think, uh, I think we have to really go to a very important, let's say, philosophical political discussion. I mean, uh, science, conscience, and consciousness. That is a trilogy that we have to refer. Of course, uh, the science has uh, produced a tremendous evolution and the scientific revolution. And we can practically today welcome all the advanced uh, discoveries, neurodata, neurodite, uh, you know, this brain, uh, computer interface. We are at the end of, uh, you know, this long road of science that have discovered to all of us. But the, what is the paradox? The paradox towards this uh, pandemic, with this uh, crisis, uh, what is the, the solution? The solution that are given to us, doctor and medical the sector, is that uh, washing our hands with soap for 30 seconds. So that is a bit ironical. After what of the advancement of uh, scientific revolution, we have to go to the old traditional uh, habit for uh, a healthy, a healthy environment. So uh, science will never be only without conscience, and that is the important element of conscience. What is conscience? If you Google the word conscience, the word, as it's commonly used in its moral sense, means the inherent sense of every healthy human being to perceive that what is right and what is wrong, impelling us towards the right direction. And definitive is the sum of moral and ethical principles that control, guide, or inhibit the thought of action executed by each individual. If an individual is guided by their conscience and what is entailed of social and moral responsibility, then one's conscience will lead him or her to the right direction. And that is do the general good, namely solidarity, fraternity, compassion, and to love your neighbor. Nevertheless, science plus conscience are not enough. We need the third angle so that our triangle is complete. Here comes consciousness. You may ask, what is the difference between conscience and consciousness? And again, if you find the definition, they say consciousness is the function and the state of awareness of the human mind that receives and processes information, store it or reject it. It is proven that the more information one is able to gather and process, the more aware and the more conscious one becomes regarding one's internal and external world. Awareness and wakefulness represent the two main components of consciousness. So, my dear friend, this triangle will help us in the implementation of international debt of conscience. Science will continue to explore innovative solutions. Conscience will lead us to right direction and consciousness will trigger our awareness and what is morally right and what we have a social and moral responsibility toward our friends and neighbors in the broader sense that transcend neighborhood to cities, countries, and continents so that solidarity, compassion, fraternity prevail for the good of all humanity. So that is my small contribution in this day of uh, International UN Day of Conscience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mortinos, for your leadership on global understanding and peace, and um, also for leading the Alliance of Civilizations, which is so vital for the world today. We are now very lucky to have a video message from Mr. Dominique Duvillepin, the former Prime Minister of France. And with apologies, again, uh, Mr. Mortinos, unfortunately, the technology, I'm not sure you'll be able to hear the video. So for you, it might be a couple moments. Thank of silence. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. on this day of conscience, thanks to the initiative of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Let's we all remember the importance of peace for the world community in such times of growing fear, rising tensions and nationalism. More than ever, 
Facing the tragic challenges of the COVID-19 epidemic, we see the necessity of a stronger solidarity, cooperation, and multilateralism. We all have today an obligation to react collectively in a burst of courage to alleviate the suffering of our nations around the world. No, nada, ya. Me han cortado ya. Hello. Great. So we had that wonderful video message um, from the ah. former president. But I cannot hear it. No. Okay. Um, but we are now moving to some video remarks we have from Tanzanian parliamentarian. Uh, she's also a professor. We have a video from Anna Kajumolo Tibajuka. At the founding conference of the United Nations, and therefore in the chart of the United Nations, the whole question of conscience was brought to the table. Because as human beings, we must run our life on principles, on values. And conscience is a gift from God. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody knows what is right and what is wrong. You don't actually need a preacher. You don't need a... You know that this is wrong. It is wrong to kill. It is wrong to not to love people. It is wrong to be lazy. All the things that human beings value, they are actually universal because they are based in our conscience. So, but it has taken 75 years. This year, when we celebrate 75 years of the United Nations, the world has finally come together to define common principles along which we can govern ourselves internally. Because self-government, go governance by each one of us through our conscience is a key. I would, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate, as I said, the people who have spearheaded uh, this campaign. It has, it has been such a, a difficult campaign, it has taken so long, but finally the work, the world has come together. Actually, I am sending this uh, message at a time when there is a global pandemic of the coronavirus. And you can see that humanity across the continent, as we confront the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic, you can see it has pricked our conscience. You can almost say that it is not just a coincidence, it is actually almost like a divine intervention that what else could bring the world together could force us to examine our conscience, our way of life, the way we treat each other, the way we share success or failures or challenges. So you find that it takes a disease by a virus, a creature which is so small, it cannot even be seen, but look at its power. So the whole, when we talk about conscious, we mean values, we mean love, we mean sharing, we mean solidarity, we mean peace, we mean prosperity for everybody. So we are talking about responsible, uh, leading a responsible life, making sure that we have sustainable development. The, 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 the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, they are all pricking our conscience, whether you're looking at food, hunger, challenge of hunger, whether you're looking at the question of the women question, gender equality, whether you're looking at the well-being of children, whatever you touch, it will finally break your conscience. So the message I would like to send is that this is a, a wake-up call for all of us. It is a common rallying point that how can we make our world a better place? Must, must it take a pandemic like coronavirus to bring everybody on the table to, to, to show the futility of nuclear weapons, for example? We, what is the use of nuclear weapons in the face of a pandemic like the one we are facing? So I would like to zero in my message on this principle that united we are strong, divided none of us is safe. So we must promote our common interest. And this common interest is, is innate in all of us. It, we are born with it. We have to love all, we have to serve all, we have to promote peace, prosperity, because together we shall be successful 
but divided we shall fall. This is the message I'm sending, and once again, I would like to congratulate the sponsors of this uh, event, the Kingdom of Bahrain, His Royal Highness Prince Harifa bin Salman al Khalifa, Sheikh Hussam, who has also been really spearheading this, and Mr. Hong in the FOPA, and all the participants, the people who have been working on this project, Nobel Prize laureates and all other who have been working very hard to make sure that we come where we are now. So from Tanzania, I should say Asante Sana, Karibuni. Thank you so much, Professor Tibajuka. As you've said, it shouldn't take a global crisis to bring us all together, and I think your message is a critical one in this time. Our next speaker is a great scientist, conservationist, and humanitarian, Dame Jane Goodall. Dr. Goodall is the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, as well as the global organization Roots and, Su Roots and Shoots. She's also a UN messenger of peace and an inspiration to people around the world. We're so grateful to have you with us, Dr. Goodall. If you could just unmute your microphone and turn on your camera. Okay, it looks like we might be having a little bit of a connection challenge with Dr. Goodall. The item after this is the Q&A, and I have one question that I'm going to direct at each of our speakers, so maybe I will take that very first question. This one is for Professor Sachs. Uh, Jeff, if you want to turn on your camera and your microphone. Uh, the first question we're going to do today is, what is the impact on human conscience after the pandemic situation of COVID-19, and how do you think it will affect achieving the SDGs? Does it strengthen existing advocacy efforts, um, or do you think it poses a challenge? Well, I think uh, definitely we don't know because major crises can be uh, a, a wake-up call, uh, as uh, Ana Tibiuka just uh, called for, or they can uh, actually lead to uh, even deeper problems. So don't take anything for granted. Uh, don't just make predictions. We have to actively work to learn from this. Uh, right now, uh, the signs are uh, very dangerous, not only the virus itself, but the uh, closing borders, uh, the nationalism, of course. Uh, uh, we're seeing uh, countries blaming each other, very, very dangerous right now. Uh, and so there's nothing that assures us that we come out of this stronger. Uh, if we take the message that uh, we shouldn't have had to wait for the pandemic itself to know, to be prepared uh, in the face of all the challenges we have uh, to uh, face the opportunities uh, and uh, adopt solutions before crises hit of the new technologies to ensure universal access of uh, people to basic uh, health systems and so forth. Uh, to have preparedness against disasters. Uh, those are the real lessons uh, from this pandemic. We could have been ready. And indeed, I think it's important to say many countries were ready. Uh, many countries, especially in East Asia, have kept the pandemic under control. Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, uh, have uh, used public health systems that were already on alert since uh, SARS 2003 uh, to control the pandemic. China, uh, after this uh, huge initial outbreak in Wuhan, uh, battled the virus under control. So preparedness can work, uh, and we need to be prepared. We need to use the Sustainable Development Goals as a roadmap which it is, it's not just something we do because it's a homework assignment, it's something that we do because it will build a better future. Let's stop listening to uh, reactionary voices that say, oh, that doesn't matter, this doesn't count. Here you have the richest country in the world, the United States, that is being overwhelmed by this pandemic right now because the precautionary measures 
uh, the attention to our systems, the honesty uh, was not being cared for properly. So we can choose to build better. We can choose to use sustainable development as our roadmap going forward. Those are the real lessons of not having been prepared for this pandemic. And we're going to have to learn, and we're going to either learn the horrendously hard way or uh, the positive way that cooperation is the only way forward. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I hope that we might have Dr. Goodall back with us again, if we can try connecting her. Yeah, there we are. Oh, fabulous. Oh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The webcam thing isn't opening. My entire computer crashed. Oh, no, at a very inopportune time. How unfortunate. Yeah. And, yeah, um, having listened to everything else, right up to the last, just before Jeffrey again, I'm pressing my webcam, webcam, which has been working, as you know, all day, and it's not working now. Isn't that frustrating? That's exceedingly frustrating. Um, and I can verify for everyone on the line that we did test it uh, several times and it was working earlier in the day. Um, I don't know if you want to just go ahead and um, read your speech or if you want to give it one more minute to try to get it connected. Well, I'm pressing webcam again. Yes. Can you see me? Um, unfortunately, we can't yet. Now you can. Yes, now we can. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodall. Honestly, what a nightmare. So should I start now? Absolutely. It's wonderful to see and hear you. OK. Well, first of all, greetings to everybody. And I want to bring in to represent all the billions of beings who haven't been mentioned at all today with regard to human consciousness. And here's the voice to represent the others. <laughs> simply means me jane and chimpanzee well as we all know we're going through very dark times as this covid 19 pandemic sweeps around the world so much suffering as people fall sick including doctors and nurses on the front line working selflessly to help others the tragedy is that we've not learned from past pandemics of this sort, even though we know how they originate, even though the one we're experiencing now has been long predicted. As we destroy the natural world, we bring animals into closer and closer contact and enable viruses to spread from one species to another. The meat markets where wild animals are sold for food create conditions that enable viruses to jump from an animal to a human and create a new mutation, such as this COVID-19. And epidemics have been created also by close contact between people and domestic animals in confined conditions. During my 85 years on planet Earth, I've witnessed the horrific harm that we've inflicted on the environment and the terrible cruelty that we've inflicted on each other. I've seen how wealthy countries have raped poorer countries for their natural resources, often leading to corrupt leaders becoming wealthy, while vast numbers of the population fall ever deeper into poverty and desperation, so that many, including children, are forced to work long hours in the fields or making garments or working in dangerous conditions in the mines they make just enough to keep them alive so that we can buy cheap goods and the rich can get richer today we should think about the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots the crippling poverty not just in the poorer countries but in the wealthiest homeless people in london and new york sleep on streets where the wealthy walk past without a thought to ride the elevator to luxury apartments and champagne dinners. So many of us take things for granted. We buy food in the supermarket 
and waste a lot. There's always water in the tap or to flush the toilet. Yet there are millions of people living close to death from lack of food, getting sick from contaminated water, and now fleeing from parts of the world that have become uninhabitable because of the climate crisis. And the climate crisis is having the most devastating effect on the poor. It's not only from war and persecution that refugees flee today. Millions seek refuge from an environment that has become increasingly hostile. And they meet hostility of a crueler kind in the places where they finally arrive. And on this first inter international day of consciousness, let us realize we're not the only sentient beings on the planet. In 1961, I was told at Cambridge University that there was a difference between us and other animals of kind, not degree, of kind, even between us and our closest biological and behavioral relative, the chimpanzee. Only we, I was told, had personalities, minds, and emotions. Fortunately, I'd been taught as a child that that simply wasn't true. My teacher was my dog, Rusty. Maybe you see him behind my shoulder here. Today, science acknowledges that humans are not the only sentient beings and that animals too can feel pain, fear, joy, and grief. And we continually learn more and more about the amazing intelligence shown by animals from Lauren? Yes, it looks like we've lost Dr. Goodall. Um, it looks like uh, maybe her computer crashed again if it crashed before when she was trying to join. Um, I'm going to hope that she can reconnect to finish her statement. And while we're waiting for her, I'm going to go to another one of our questions. I, I think, uh, Lauren, um, if we still have to, Lauren, I think we're going to have to wrap up because we're way uh, past the schedule. Uh, if people are uh, having to leave. Uh, so I think we should uh, move to the wrap up. Okay, um, that's you, Jeff, closing remarks and our final video message. Yeah, Th thank you, I apologize. And uh, what a wonderful statement of uh, Dr. Goodall. Uh, uh, if we wanna hear the rest, we will post the rest, certainly uh, what wisdom. Uh, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of the uh, listeners and uh, and participants uh, of uh, today's uh, gathering. Uh, this has been a very uh, special event at a very special time. I want to thank all of you for your commitment to the culture of peace, which is the, the theme of the International Day of uh, Conscience. Special thanks to the Kingdom of Bahrain, which has been the champion of the International Day of Conscience and uh, our convener for today. Uh, thank you for the leadership of the Kingdom uh, on uh, the culture of peace. Uh, thank you to this remarkable uh, group of uh, participants. Uh, we're just uh, honored and thrilled that you have all been with us. I want to say to people all over the world, Please uh, stay safe uh, and secure. Keep your loved ones and family members safe. Uh, work uh, uh, as you can remotely uh, um, in security to promote the end of uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, the rapid uh, return to uh, the, the lives we want to live uh, out of uh, this fear uh, and uh, isolation. Uh, let's come together from. Uh, this uh, great challenge and build on it uh, through uh, using this International Day of Conscience to 
foster an even greater commitment to social justice, to human rights, and to sustainable development. Uh, it's been a great uh, honor and joy to be with the people from all over the world on this uh, first ever celebration of the International Day of Conscience. We're going to uh, close with a special video uh, from the Kingdom of Bahrain. I see Jane has uh, just uh, been able to reconnect. Jane, if you could give us the closing words, that would be wonderful. Uh, your words are, are so fantastic. Uh, if you could close, and then we will turn uh, immediately to the video of uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain. Can you hear me? We do hear you now, and uh, we hope the connection holds up for the end of your statement. Yes, it will. It's been, I don't know what happened to it today, honestly. Here we go. I just reached the end, too. So we were talking about animal sentience and that they had personality, minds, and feelings. Each one has his or her personality and emotions and can feel pain, fear, despair. Let me end with my reasons for hope. We will get through this pandemic as we have got through others. Many of us will have realized as we are confined to our houses, as we face shortage of supplies, especially toilet paper, that we should no longer take our freedom and our health for granted, and that we should have more respect for the natural world. We shall then be better people, more understanding, more compassionate, more respectful of each other, and of the other animals we share the planet with. This is the first International Day of Consciousness. Let it be a wake-up call so that every day of every year we try to find ways to address inequality and make ethical choices in what we buy and eat and wear. We must allow that still, small voice of consciousness to sound louder and louder until, when head and heart work in harmony, we shall finally attain our true, our true human potential. And the, the little tiny bit I missed out in the middle, that I said, knowing animals are sentient. Let us pause to think of the billions of animals hunted in the wild, trafficked to be sold for food, for entertainment, to be tortured in medical and pharmaceutical research laboratories and with the billions of animals treated as walking food in factory farms. Let us realize that each of these animals is a sentient being. Each one has his or her personality and emotions. Each one can feel pain, fear, and despair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodall. And now the video from the Kingdom of Bahrain. The visionary role played by His Royal Highness Prince Khalifa, the Prime Minister of Bahrain, in promoting peace and strengthening relationships among the people of the world should not be underestimated. It has been the leadership of His Royal Highness that assured that the efforts of Bahrain's government were directed to realizing the highest development goals for its people and focusing their attention in promoting the principles for establishing a movement celebrating a world culture of peace and understanding, an effort irrespective of race, color, or creed, where all people would come together across the globe and work to preserve the right of all to a healthier environment and a secure and peaceful lifestyle. His Highness, Prince Khalifa, had directed Bahrain's representatives to engage with partners and seek out people of a similar mind to initiate this movement based on world conscience. In the initiating message to the United Nations General Assembly, His Royal Highness had stated that there is an urgent need for an occasion on which 
all people can unite to intensify efforts that preserve the right of all to live in peace and harmony within secure and stable environments. Environments that sustain development and promote human well-being, yet preserve the ability of the planet to support both human and natural life. It was the direct result of these far-sighted efforts that initiated the adoption unanimously by the United Nations of Resolution 73-329 in July 2019. The President of the General Assembly, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa, we welcomes the declaration of 5th April as the International Day of Conscience. The PJ welcomes this initiative of the Prime Minister of Bahrain, His Royal Highness Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, supported by Member States. After the official announcement at the United Nations, His Royal Highness received many congratulatory messages from all the ambassadors to Bahrain and one from His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who welcomed the efforts of His Highness in promoting peace and prosperity through the Day of Conscience. His Highness also briefed all the ambassadors on his expectations for the inaugural celebrations and that would reflect and focus world attention and influence the strong will of the people of the world to make world conscience a cornerstone of collective action towards a safer, more peaceful and stable world. Most peoples of the world believe everyone has a conscience, a personal space within us, a place where God's values are written on our soul. I think that the Day of Conscience is a wonderful initiative and something that the world can finally enjoy and look forward to. I think it's wonderful that there are still leaders in the world who care about love and peace and that we should all shout about it on the day. On the Day of Conscience, do I have to like my sister? Bahrain has always felt like a safe haven to us. It's a wonderful island, it's beautiful, and the people over here are kind and generous. Humanity's thinking and the actions should reflect the fact that we are one human family. On the Day of Conscience, we should all join together and demonstrate that. With consciousness comes ethics, motivation and principles. So on the Day of Consciousness, I hope that we see many more people adopt these principles as well. A virus is infecting the entire world and this virus knows no national boundaries. So why do countries insist on acting selfishly? The Day of Conscience is a chance to change that for all the countries to unify their efforts and act as one. The Day of Conscience provides an occasion for all those seeking an opportunity to join His Royal Highness, Bahrain, and the people of the world in making world conscience the cornerstone of collective action, specifically in the advancement of building a world culture of peace with love and conscience. So I think that's the end of our video, uh, unless Professor Sachs has any final thoughts or closing remarks, I will thank our speakers and sign off. Go ahead, Jeff. Just to say thank you again to everybody, and uh, it was uh, great to, to be with you and uh, to the Kingdom of Bahrain. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful message and for the leadership. Uh, I see Stefania. Uh, uh, maybe you uh, also uh, waving goodbye from UNESCO uh, in Paris, uh, and uh, uh, also we want to congratulate you for all of your leadership. Thanks to all. We've come to the end of the session, and uh, we will celebrate uh, next year's uh, International Day of uh, Conscience uh, together. Uh, past this epidemic, uh, we trust, and on our way to the kind of uh, future that we want to build together. Thank you so much to all.